lockdown. 2 p.m. Time for questions. Senator McAllister. Thanks, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Yesterday in question time, the minister was unable to answer what advice the Morrison Joyce government had received about the prevalence and impact of long COVID, including in relation to children and infants. Last night, he sought advice and clarified that, and I quote, longer term impacts of COVID-19 to children under 16 years is emerging. Will the minister admit to Australian parents that the Morrison-Joyce government can't tell them what the impacts of long COVID are on their children? The minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, I have to say I, it is really very disturbing. It is really very disturbing that the Labor Party continue to try and frighten Australians with respect Order, to the impact of this virus. Mr. President, this virus has been with us for a little over 18 months. We are still Order, learning Senators about Pratt and Watt. this virus, Mr. President. We are still learning about this virus. Senator Pratt, and Mr. Ten. President, as we learn about that virus, as that advice comes to us, Mr. President, so we are very comfortable in providing that information to the Australian people so that they can understand it too. But it, it is changing all the time, and as information emerges, we work with with, with health agencies around the world to better understand the impacts of the virus. And of course, Mr. President, of course, Mr. President, as different variants of the virus emerge, they also have different impacts, Mr. President. And so, Mr. President, uh, I did reply, respond to uh, the chamber, as I said I would in question time Order. yesterday, Mr. President, uh, and indicated that it is still uh, that we are all still learning about the syndrome. Uh, but it also, Mr. President, it also indicates, Mr. President, the importance of the other measures that we have in place to support Australians uh, in dealing with the virus, including the process of vaccination of the broader population, Mr. President, because we know that when we vaccinate the broader population and we get those rates up, that protects everyone because it limits the transmission of the virus through the community, Mr. President. So we will. Um, uh, 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 continue to work uh, to understand the virus, working with the health professionals. Uh, there are some, some symptoms of this that will continue Order. to emerge. Senator, Mr. Colbeck. Senator McAllister, a supplementary question. Thanks, Mr. President. Israel, which has fully vaccinated 78 per cent of people aged 12 years and over, has predicted that by September half of new COVID cases will be in children. How many Australian children are, protected, are projected to contract COVID when Australia reaches the 70 and 80 per cent vaccination targets for those aged over 16? Senator Colbeck. Mr President, um, those figures will depend on the amount of virus trans being transmitted through the community, Mr President. Uh, well, Senator, Senator, I think it's a ridiculous thing for you to state across the chamber because the, the, uh, the information will be Order. dependent on the amount of virus being transmitted through the community, uh, will depend on the various variants of the virus uh, that might be being transmitted at that point in time, Mr President. And we know uh, the Delta variant, for example, is much more transmissible than the Alpha one was. Uh, the virus continues to mutate, uh, and the effects of that uh, are being felt and learnt in respect of the way uh, that the virus moves through the community. But we do know one thing. Uh, Order. We do know one thing, Mr President. There are a range of principles that we can do to protect ourselves. Social distancing, Order. Uh, processes that we're doing with the states with respect to restriction of movement and, of course, vaccination, Mr President. Senator McAllister, a final supplementary question. Yes, Mr President. The Morrison-Joyce government was responsible for the tragic deaths of 685 older Australians in residential aged care last year and has failed First Nations children in Western New South Wales who account for more than 40 per cent of new cases. How can Australian parents possibly trust 
that this government will protect their kids. Right. If we could stop the interjections before the minister started answering the question, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, uh, and I reject entirely the characterisation. Reject entirely the characterisation that Senator McAllister puts on the. Reject entirely the characterisation that Senator McAllister puts on her question, Mr. President. Uh, and it's quite clear, Mr. President, that despite some Order. members, despite some Order. members, Mr. President, of the Labor Party Order. indicating that so they, Senator Colbeck, please resume your seat. Across the chamber, I can't hear the minister. Don't interject and don't take the bait. Is the easiest way to remain silent. I wouldn't laugh too loudly, Senator Watt. Senator Colbeck, to continue. Thank you. And it's quite clear, Mr. President quite clear that despite some members of the opposition indicating that they support the national plan to emerge from COVID, that there's quite a few on that side that don't. And it's about time Order. they got on board, Mr President, because I, I can tell you the Australian people are on board. They want to take up Order. their vaccinations. They want their Senator freedoms McAllister back. And, and it's about Polly. time the Labor Party did, Senator did Polly. other than undermine the national plan for us to recover from COVID and get on board with the rest of us. Order. Well, I'll, I'll call Senator Dean Smith when there's silence. Senator Smith. Thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Can the minister update the Senate on the evacuation operation in Kabul? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President, and may I thank Senator Smith for his question. Uh, Mr President, uh, so far uh, we have evacuated approximately 4,000 people, Australian citizens, permanent residents, visa holders and others, on 29 flights over the past eight days. I offer my profound thanks to the many Australian officials who have worked and are working on this operation, particularly my own Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and the Department of Home Affairs and Defence. Our cooperation with other countries, including New Zealand, the United Kingdom and the United States, has been vital in achieving this outcome, and we thank our partners for that important cooperation. Last night and this morning, we evacuated around 1,200 people from Kabul on six ADF flights and one NZDF flight. I can also confirm that since the 18th of August, we have brought 639 evacuees back to Australia, following flight into Brisbane early this morning, carrying 220 people. This has followed previous flights to Perth, Melbourne and Adelaide. To those Afghans who have already arrived in Australia, we say welcome back to the Australians and the permanent residents and welcome to your new home, to our visa holders. To those soon to travel here, we look forward to your arrival. We can only imagine the challenges that you have been dealing with in recent times. We thank the states and territories for their support in this important evacuation. As I said, we understand this is an extremely distressing time for, Afghanistan's in, for Australians in Kabul and others such as visa holders and visa applicants. For those in Australia who still have family and friends in Afghanistan, we do understand that distress. We are fully aligned with our international partners uh, to insist the Taliban holds to international standards of human rights and protections. We do remain focused on, the, focused on the safe evacuation from Afghanistan of as many Australians and visa holders as possible for as long as possible, Mr Senator President. Smith, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister update the Senate on the changes to Australia's travel advice to Afghanistan? Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr President. The uh, security situation in Kabul was already dangerous and volatile and has deteriorated further. Early this morning, we changed our travel advice. For Australians and Australian visa holders in Afghanistan, the new advice is do not travel to Hamburg Karzai International Airport. It is not safe to do so. If you are in the immediate area of the airport, leave now, move to a safe location and await further advice. There is the potential for violence and security threats with large crowds. There is an ongoing and very high threat of terrorist attack. Our partners, including New Zealand and the UK, have taken similar steps to our own, and others, including the US and Canada, have amended their uh, travel advice equivalents. The government's priority throughout this operation has been the safety of Australians and their families and visa holders, and that remains the case. Senator Smith, final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. 
Can the minister update the Senate on the government's continued support for Australians and visa holders in Afghanistan? Senator Payne. Mr President, the Australian government notes the Taliban has made undertakings about foreign nationals seeking to leave Afghanistan. Uh, we continue to seek that they observe those undertakings, uh, including to uphold human rights and to allow our citizens and Australian visa holders to depart safely if they wish to do so. For Australians who remain in Afghanistan, please register with the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade if you have not done so already. The Department of Home Affairs will proactively contact those who have been granted temporary safe haven subclass 449 visas but remain in Afghanistan with advice about what they should do when it is safe. We will continue to process visa applications from Afghans seeking protection. The government will work with the International Organisation for Migration, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, Afghan community leaders in Australia and leading refugee advocates and service providers to welcome people from yeah. Afghanistan. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, Mr President. And my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Education and Youth, Senator Reynolds. Reports says, suggest around 30 per cent of COVID-19 cases in New South Wales and 40 per cent of cases in Victoria are in those 19 and younger. How many children have contracted COVID-19 in New South Wales and how many in Victoria during the current Delta outbreak? The Minister representing the Minister for Education and Youth, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank the Senate and I thank the Senator for the question. Uh, I don't have those statistics to hand, but I will see if I can get them and reply to you uh, as soon as I can. Senator O'Neill, a supplementary question. The Minister taking on notice. Um, as of last week, 40 per cent of COVID-19 cases in Western New South Wales were in First Nations children. How many First Nations children have contracted COVID-19 in the current Delta outbreaks in New South Wales and how many in Victoria? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much and I thank the Senator for that question. Uh, I will also have to take that on notice. Uh, given that this is a health question, I'll take it on notice and get back to you. Order. 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 Senator Watt, Ministers treating the Senate with courtesy. Minister answering should be allowed to take it on notice in order. Senator O'Neill. So, um, again, in your capacity representing the Minister for Education and Youth, how many children across Australia are currently battling COVID-19? And does the Prime Minister still believe it's not a race? Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr President. And I will also have to take that one on notice, again, because Order. it's the Department of Health. Uh, that keeps those statistics, and I am the Minister for the NDIS. Hmm. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction. Minister, the world has witnessed and experienced extreme weather in the last few months. We've had flooding, bushfires, heat waves across Europe, the US, China, and India. We, of course, had our own climate fires here in Australia as well. We are facing code red when it comes to our climate and the health of our planet. So why, in this climate crisis, is the Morrison government and the Labor Party spending millions of public dollars propping up and opening up new gas fields like in the Beetaloo Basin that will only increase emissions by 6 per cent and make climate change worse? The Minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Seselja. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Mr President, and I thank uh, Senator Hanson Young for the question. Uh, in terms of part of the question uh, as to why the Labor Party supported the government, I can't answer for the Labor Party except to perhaps say uh, they had a temporary dose of common sense uh, in supporting uh, the coalition government when it comes to energy policy, but when it comes to our support for unlocking gas in the Beetaloo Basin. Uh, this is about uh, a gas-led recovery and about our strategy to make sure uh, that we have reliable and affordable energy uh, as we embark 
uh, on a process of ensuring our economy continues to reduce its emissions, uh, but we are able to, and we are able to play our part uh, in an international uh, effort uh, to reduce emissions uh, without killing our economy. Uh, and so, when we support when we support gas, uh, what we are doing is we are actually supporting a whole range of energy sources because uh, if you want to see the massive uptake in renewables uh, that we have seen in this country at a record rate, uh, you need to make sure that you have the firming power, the, the um, uh, base load energy uh, that enables our economy to continue. Now, uh, the question, of course, therefore needs to be asked of the Greens, uh, which base load energy source do they support? Because I've never actually heard the Greens ever indicate uh, which baseload energy they support. They don't support gas. They don't support coal. They don't support hydro. Uh, which, which particular source of baseload energy that would support renewables, that would support um, uh, uh, solar energy, that would support wind, uh, do the Greens support? Well, this government supports renewable energy, but we also support affordable and reliable energy for our economy. Uh, that's what we're doing, Order. and Senator that's why Seselja, we're supporting the Bedaloo Basin and the opening expired. up. Senator Hanson Young, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Well, what an example of the bumbling fools on this side, really. I mean, honestly, your latest coal and gas subsidy announced today will force householders and businesses to pay more for their power bills. You talk about not wanting to uh, not wanting to kill the economy. Well, this whack and attack on the renewable energy in industry announced today is foolish. How much are Australians going to have to pay on their power bills because of your coal keeper plan? Senator Seselja. Uh, well, thank you, and I thank uh, Senator Hanson Young uh, for the question because what she has demonstrated again with that question is that she wants to bring uh, the former Labor government in South Australia's experiment in that state national. That is what the Greens would like to see. They would like to see the Australian people not having the energy they need to support jobs, to support the economy and to support their ability to live their lives uh, in the kind of comfort that many of us have come to expect and, in, in fact, the Greens, of course, have come to expect. Because I always am interested in the lecturing tone from the Greens, who never lead by example. Uh, you know, I, I once, I'm reminded of a local Green who said, you know, we, we want to take you back to the caves, but just not yet. Just not yet. Well, the Greens aren't prepared to go there. They're not prepared to go there. They're prepared to enjoy uh, all of the abundant energy sources we have. We're bringing down energy prices. That's what we've been doing. Right. We're not going to take advice Order, from the Senator Greens, Selger, which would time destroy for the answer our economy. Has expired. Senator Hanson Young, a final supplementary question. The intellectual prowess represented on the front bench here. Energy market analysts have estimated that your coal keeper plan is going to cost householders from $180 to $430. Can you confirm? Will the government tell us? How much, your power, how much householders' power bills are going to be because of your dodgy plan to prop coal up today? Senator Seselja. Well, thank you very much, and I, I reject the premise of the question from Senator Hanson Young. Uh, what we have seen uh, under this government uh, is that our policies have seen energy prices coming down. And this is how you get energy prices down in this country. You get investment in new technologies. You get investment in renewables, which we've seen order. at record Senator rates. Senator Hanson Young, on a point of order. Thank you. Relevance. I asked whether the government could confirm how much householders' power bills would okay, cost Senator under Hansen this Young, plan. Senator Hanson Young, your question had a great deal of commentary, commenced with what I assume was a sarcastic barb. And quite frankly, if questions are phrased in that way, then ministers have a great deal of discretion in how they can answer them. Um, it wasn't just as simple as you outlined. Senator Seselja. Thank you. And clearly, Sarah Hanson-Young is in a very bad mood uh, this afternoon. And uh, I don't know what's you, caused use that. Use people's uh, correct titles, uh, please, uh, Senator. Uh, 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 Senator Hanson Young, did I say? No, so is clearly is clearly got some of the angry pills today. But what I would what I would say in response to Senator Hanson Young is that our policies have been bringing energy prices down, and and what we are what we are not going to do is not what we are not going to do is take advice from the Greens about getting rid of baseload energy, not investing in gas. We will continue to invest in that because it is an, a critically important part of our energy mix that will support the economy and support Order, our Senator efforts Seselja. to reduce now, emissions. I didn't 
quite catch everything said there due to some interjections, but I remind senators not to make reflections that are personal or directed at other individual senators when they are addressing the chamber. Senator Patrick, remotely. I saw Senator Patrick there before. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, my question is to the Minister for Government Services. In the three weeks, weeks since I, <clears throat> I highlighted the impending utilisation of vaccine certificates and pointed out the flaws in the government's own solutions in respect of forgery, <coughs> excuse me, we've had Western Australia and Queensland announce access to their, uh, to their states will require uh, a vaccination status check. And we've had employers announce vaccinations will will soon become. What I'm going to do is I'm going to ask Senator Patrick to log on, then log off. I'm going to go. Uh, Senator Patrick, um, the system, when it's running all day, does tend to come under strain. Can you log on, log off? And what I'll do is I'll come to you for the next question. So I'll now go to Senator Askew and then I'll come back to Senator Patrick. Senator Askew. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Sen Senator Birmingham. Can the Minister advise the Senate how the Liberal and Nationals government is delivering its economic recovery plan and supporting Australians to chart our way back from the COVID-19 pandemic, including through the National Plan agreed by the National Cabinet? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Askew for her question. A very important question uh, about indeed Australia's performance through this once in a century global pandemic uh, and our pathway through to the other side of it. Uh, Mr. President, Australians have much to be proud of in the way they've responded to this pandemic. The responses of Australians with the work of their governments, business and others have seen an estimated 30,000 lives saved around Australia and compared with the type of devastation that we've seen in so many other countries. And although Parts of the country are doing it tough right now, and we should never underestimate the success we've had as a nation in responding in world-leading ways, saving those 30,000 lives, saving as well, Mr President, uh, an estimated close to one million jobs during the course of this pandemic as a result of effective policy measures. Right from the start of the pandemic, the closure of our international borders uh, that managed to keep so successfully right through the pandemic in so many different ways, what would have been a flood and a wave of COVID cases from coming into the country and spreading throughout the country. Equally, Mr. President, the economic supports from JobKeeper through to the coronavirus supplement, cash flow boosts, temporary full expensing measures, supports to targeted sectors like aviation, tourism, business payments now being delivered directly with the states and disaster assistance payments directly to affected individuals. Our economy has demonstrated resilience again and again and we should have confidence that it will do so once more when current lockdowns and restrictions ease, particularly growing confidence as we see vaccination numbers hit new records, more than 335,000 achieved yesterday, helping Australia surge towards the scientifically based uh, targets of the Doherty Institute of 70 and 80 per cent full vaccination rates that can give confidence and hope and safety to Australians that we will be able to achieve a greater sense of normality in the future, and through that, Order. help to get Senator our country Birmingham. to the Senator other side. Senator, ask you a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, despite the COVID-19 challenges Australia is currently facing, what does recent data demonstrate about the resilience of our economy? Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, there's continued to be significant support in terms of our economy, and from that support, significant strength in our economy. The jobs market has shown great resilience, coming back strongly from different lockdowns and shutdowns and holding up very strongly. Just last week, we saw real wages data continuing to remain above pre-pandemic levels. These things are a contrast to so much of the rest of the world. And indeed today, the Future Fund, an important, hugely important asset for our nation, has delivered its strongest ever investment earnings through the 2020-21 year where earnings have grown by 22.2%, up some $35.7 billion, tripling, Mr. President, the initial investments that have been made in the Future Fund, ensuring that nest egg for our nation's future is as strong as possible. 
These all demonstrate resilience, strength and capability across the Australian economy and should give people confidence for the future. Senator, ask you a final supplementary question. Thank you for that answer. Minister, what can all Australians do to help deliver the national plan and build further confidence in our recovery from COVID-19 for all Australian households and businesses? Senator Birmingham. The national plan is about giving Australians confidence in the safety of themselves and their families, as well as confidence in the reopening of our economy, that they will be able to get their businesses back on a stable footing, their jobs even more secure, and that we can resume the type of growth that our country has seen in recent years, strong growth in jobs numbers, providing strong opportunities for all Australians. To support this plan, Australians need to do as they currently are, turning out in record numbers to get vaccinated. Over 70s have now had, uh, some 86% plus of over 70s have now had the first dose of vaccine. 59.9% .9 of them have had their second dose. Across the whole population of 16 plus, 55.2% have now had their first dose. As we see the Otago advice being received in relation to children, continued increase in supply, growth in the more than 8,900 centres to get a vaccine, Order. all should have Senator confidence Birmingham, that we can deliver this plan. Senator Patrick is back, I believe. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Government Services. In the three weeks since I highlighted the impending utilisation of vaccination certificates and the fact that the government solution is easily forged, we've had uh, the Western Australian and Queensland governments announce access to their states will rely on vaccination status, and we've had employees announce that vaccination will become compulsory. In the same time, vaccination, the vaccination program has delivered over 4.4 million doses and adds almost uh, 290,000 doses a day. The value in proof of vaccination is climbing. The problem is getting bigger. The system is flawed, relying on one, uh, relying on a solution that, uh, that could possibly undermine attempts to stop the virus spreading. Can the minister explain what the uh, solution uh, to this mess is? The Minister for Government Services, Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. And first of all, I would totally reject the premise of or well, the assertions from Senator Patrick that is simply not the case, and let me explain why. The national plan our government has developed and agreed to is our pathway to living with this virus. That is our goal to live with this virus, not to live in fear of it. The government, and in fact all ministers in this place, are working in our various areas with states and territories, including on this matter and we are looking for a pathway forward. Vaccination is clearly the key to keeping Australians safe and how we get our lives back in a COVID world. Medicare's long-standing and reliable system underpins the Australian Immunisation Register, or otherwise called AIR, which plays a central role today in recording COVID-19 vaccinations. Uh, the AIR itself was established in 1996 and has a long-standing and very trusted uh, reputation and history. Many parents are familiar with its record keeping and also proof of childhood immunisations. And it's only logical that this database is used to capture COVID-19 vaccinations in a secure, reliable and trusted way. Privacy and security considerations are, of course, among the top priorities for any digital solution the government develops. Uh, and this digital certificate is absolutely no exception. Contemporary cybersecurity is in place to protect people's personal information, and COVID-19 digital certificates do have features to safeguard against fraudulent activity, consistent with all other official government documents, such as birth certificates and citizenship certificates. We are, however, continually evolving our security technology to meet uh, contemporary and emerging threats, and we are very confident in the robust monitoring and fraud detection mechanisms in place to protect Medicare details. And since mandating the recording of COVID-19 vaccinations on the air, the Commonwealth has further boosted proof of vaccination certificates, security measures, Order. and the government Senator continues Reynolds, to do time so. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Patrick, a supplementary question. Uh, respectfully, Minister, we don't have a system where someone can present easily to a, to a cinema operator or to an airline operator and uh, do so with the uh, confidence required uh, for the verification uh, 
we need to have a simple solution. What is the schedule uh, to get a robust working solution? When are we going to see a solution, a forge proof solution, easy to use, that can be deployed? Order. Senator Patrick. Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much. And again, I thank Senator Patrick for the question. Uh, as I said in response to the first answer, the federal government, and including Services Australia, continues to work on evolving uh, these certificates for a variety of purposes. The digital vaccination certificate is now available through MyGov. The Commonwealth has provided Australians with an initial quick and reliable way to access their proof of COVID-19 vaccination when they need, need it, including in response to public health settings imposed by states and territories when proof of vaccination may be required. More than 2.5 million people have now accessed their digital vaccination certificate. It has been, and it will continue to be, an individual's responsibility to provide proof of vaccination should it be required by states and territories. The Commonwealth and state and territory governments are currently in consideration of a number of options for how to, to, how to uh, progress and evolve the proof of vaccination and possibly how it could be integrated into state and territory, Order. their Senator own COVID-19. The answer expired. Senator Brown. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture and Northern Australia, Senator Mackenzie. The Inspector General of Biosecurity found that officials from the Federal Department of Agriculture made crucial errors in relation to the Ruby Princess. Federal officials did not administer traveller with, with illness uh, checklists, did not, re did not review the ship's medical log and therefore did not contact New South Wales Health to raise concerns about six pa sick oh, passengers oh, yeah, and crew. The Inspector General told ABC no, no, that, and I quote, if the department had done what it agreed to do, then the chances of a Ruby Princess incident happening were significantly reduced, end quote. Does the Morrison-Joyce government accept this finding? Now, I must apologise to the Chamber at this point and to Senator Patrick, because my um, scribble meant that I had missed his second supplementary. I'm sorry, Senator Patrick. Um, please accept my sincere apologies. Um, my intention is to move on with Senator Brown's question, because Senator Patrick just texted me then, but I'll own up to that. I think it's the first time I've done that in my time in the chair. Um, I owe you one, Senator Patrick. I'll give you an extra one sometime. Um, <laughs> Senator, the Minister representing the Minister for um, Agriculture in Northern Australia, Senator Mackenzie. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank the Senator for her question. Um, my advice from the Minister for Agriculture on this uh, particular issue is the Australian Government is committed to protecting the lives and livelihoods of Australians from COVID-19 and takes the matter of the Ruby Princess incident very seriously. The New South Wales Special Commission into the Ruby Princess found the incident was primarily a failing of New South Wales Health. Uh, at uh, Minister Little Proud's request, the Inspector General of Biosecurity reviewed matters relating to the arrival of the Ruby Princess uh, and made 42 recommendations. Minister Little Proud asked the department to implement all recommendations from both the Inspector General's review and the Walker inquiry as a matter of priority, and significant progress has been made. In the article published by the ABC on the 24th of August 2021, the Inspector General of Biosecurity said many other improvements were also being made. And I quote, I am dramatically more positive about the ability of the department to deal with these things today than I would have been at the same time last year. Uh, Minister Littleproud has said that the department could improve, but it is not, ultimate, it is ul not ultimately responsible for the human health assessment. In response to the New South Wales Commission and the review of the by the Inspector General, a series of actions have already been taken to improve the department's capability to respond to human biosecurity risks. New arrangements for communicating with human biosecurity officers and port stakeholders about human health issues are working well. Senator Brown, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. The New South Wales Special Commissioner Brett Walker SC told the ABC, and I quote, there must be a real chance, a sensible possibility, that if the Commonwealth had done a better job on the Ruby Princess, that state that the state officers may not have made the mistakes they did, end quote. 
the Morrison-Joyce government did not permit federal officials to appear as witnesses before Mr Walker in the New South Wales Commission of Inquiry. Why? Why? Senator Mackenzie. Oh, I, I heard you, Senator. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Um, in part of the new arrangements, commercial vessels continue to arrive in Australia, uh, and where COVID-19 is confirmed or suspected in the crew, state health authorities have been effectively managing the risk Senator, in consultation Senator McKenzie, with Senator the Senator Keneally, on a point of order. I, I do realise the minister's relevance, and I do realise the minister has only been speaking for 15 seconds, but. Her answer seems to be in no way relevant to the question whatsoever. The question was why weren't federal agriculture officials allowed to appear before the New South Wales Special the, Commissioner of Inquiry? This answer seems to Senator be completely Kenley, as I've said before, irrelevant. Senator Kenneally, there was a, a quotation and a preamble to it. A minister is entitled to address that part of a question, not just the part at the end. Short, specific questions give much less discretion to those answering them. But the minister is entitled to address the quotation that was made, that was that before the part of the question you mentioned. Senator Mackenzie. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Um, so legislation with changes that were recommended by both the New South Wales Commission and the Inspector General's review will be introduced to Parliament. And since the Ruby Princess incident, the government has also invested a further $400 million in biosecurity in the 21-22 budget, on top of record spending in 20, 2021. This will, among other matters, see a funding boost for staff at the front line and to help modernise uh, some of those border systems. It, the Department of Agriculture, Water and Environment Order. continues to work with state and territories and port uh, stakeholders to further adjust systems and processes to better manage human health and biosecurity. They've established Order, formal Senator protocols. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Brown, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. The Ru Ruby Princess resulted in 600 cases of COVID-19 and 28 deaths in Australia. Will the Morrison Joyce government now apologise for failing to stop? The one boat that mattered. Senator Order, Senator Rennick, Senator Mackenzie. Well, thank you, Mr. President. And uh, to answer and respond to the Senator's question, of course, every single live loss through this global pandemic here at home is a tragedy. And there has been an inquiry by the New South Wales Commission, and there has been an, in Order. an inquiry. Commissioned by Order, our Keneally. own Minister for Agriculture, David Littleproud, through the Inspector General of Biosecurity. And those recommendations have been handed down, and our government is committed to actually progressing and addressing those issues, Order. every single matter. The Minister has also sought additional funding to ensure that those who are at the front line of our biosecurity Order. here in this country, whether it is at ports uh, like uh, the one mentioned or whether it is at airports, that our biosecurity officers have the very, very best technology and processes available Order. to keep Senator Australia McKenzie, safe. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Reynolds. Can the minister advise the Senate why the national plan agreed by National Cabinet is critical to charting our way back from the COVID-19 pandemic, particularly for our most vulnerable Australians? The Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, Mr President. And I'd like to thank Senator Hughes for her question and for her tireless advocacy uh, in this area. Thank you. Uh, all First Ministers through the National Cabinet have agreed in principle to our national plan to chart our path out of COVID-19 and the targets we need to reach to get there. It is built on a very clear premise. If you get vaccinated, we can make lockdowns, border closures and restrictions a thing of the past. Millions of Australians are playing their part to get to the next step on this pathway to living with the virus. There is no better example than that than our wonderful disability support workers who are working so hard uh, throughout this pandemic to protect those they care for. And uh, as a measure of that, since early July, more than 60,000, that's 60,000 uh, disability workers have voluntarily been vaccinated. And can I thank each and every one of them for putting themselves forward to receive the vaccination. A total of 95,500, or just under 60 per cent, of uh, disability workers have now received a first dose, 
and 40 per cent have received two doses. And I would encourage all disability workers to step forward to protect themselves and also to protect those that they support and they care for. So on behalf of all Australians, and I'm sure all in this chamber, I thank and extend my appreciation to our wonderful disability care and support workers who are doing such a magnificent job in a very difficult time. Senator Hughes, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, how has Australia compared to other nations, such as the United Kingdom, in protecting people with disability from COVID-19? Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you very much, and again, thank you very much, uh, Senator Hughes, for that. And I note her comments in the chamber yesterday on this very subject, which is close uh, to her heart. Australia's experience in relation to COVID-19 pandemic has varied significantly to the rest of the world, including, as Senator Hughes asked, the United King Kingdom. And can I say I find it in almost unbelievably irresponsible to unnecessarily alarm Australians with disabilities and those who love them with alarmist and totally and utterly irrelevant Order. assumptions and international comparisons. The facts matter in this, and they matter a great deal. Those opposite are fond of quoting the UK statistics, so let's have a look at the facts. To date, the UK has reported 6.5 million COVID infections, while Australia, with 40 per cent of the population, has less than 50,000. Uh, and 132 in the UK of these cases have been amongst those with disability, and in Australia it is 250 cases. So again, using Order. alarmist Senator information Reynolds, from overseas is irresponsible and in Senator Hughes, a final supplementary question. Order. You finish? You finish? Order on my left. Senator Hughes. Mr President. Having secured my gorgeous 12 year olds appointment this morning for his first and second Pfizer shot, thank you for opening it up to all of our 12 plus NDIS participants. So, Minister, why is the acceleration in the vaccine rollout so important to ensuring the delivery of the national plan and Australia's recovery from COVID 19? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and that is indeed good news, Senator Hughes. Uh, nationally, we have seen a significant acceleration of the vaccine rollout, now with more than 17.7 million doses being administered. We're vaccinating just under 2 million each week and 1 million in the last three days alone. And there has been a concerted effort across government and the disability sector to communicate the importance of vaccination and to provide information on the over 8,000 uh, channels now available. The rates of NDIS participants, like the national rollout, has accelerated significantly over the last few months. Uh, of NDIS participants, more than 95,000 have been vaccinated since early June. Nearly half of all participants and over 16s have now had one dose. Uh, and pleasingly, vaccination rates for NDIS participants in shared accommodation has tripled, has tripled since the beginning of June, with 68% now having received their first, first dose. And as Senator Hughes says, uh, all participants over Order. 12 years Senator old Reynolds, are now eligible for, for vaccination. Has expired. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Yesterday, instead of taking responsibility for his slow and bungled vaccine rollout, which is causing the current COVID outbreaks, Mr Morrison blamed Queenslanders for their vaccination numbers. Why is Mr Morrison shifting blame to Queenslanders instead of taking responsibility for his failures to roll out the vaccine, which have left Queenslanders vulnerable to COVID-19? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Well, it must be another day ending in why, because Senator Watt is seeking to peddle mistruths in the chamber. So, Mr President, that is not at all what the Prime Minister has done or said. Indeed, I can really only think of two Queenslanders who might stand out in terms of being unhelpful to the vaccine rollout. That would be the Premier and the Chief Health Officer, both of whom seem to do their utmost and to try to dent confidence in it early on. But I'm thrilled to know that Queenslanders have overcome those theatrics from their leaders, that Queenslanders are actually responding in strong numbers to the vaccine rollout, as indeed are all Australians. And that's the crucial thing, Mr President. The job is getting done. Australians are turning out in record numbers. More than 330,000 did so yesterday. It's driving our country at rates of people getting vaccinated faster on a per capita basis 
than the US or the UK ever achieved. And we want to encourage Australians to do so. And we completely reject the type of negativity we get from Senator Watt. Senator Watt, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Today, the Queensland Government has announced that after months of the Morrison Government failing to deliver, Queensland will go it alone and build a dedicated quarantine facility at Wellcamp Airport near Toowoomba. 18 months into the COVID Order. crisis, why is the Morrison-Joyce Government still failing to take responsibility for delivering safe national quarantine? Order. Senator Birmingham. Senator Rennick. Or Senator Birmingham. Mr President, we're grateful for all the states and territories who have worked with us in the delivery of quarantine, which has overwhelmingly been safe and effective in the return of hundreds of thousands of people from overseas. Contrary to what Senator Watt's saying, we're also getting on with building quarantine facilities, construction underway in Melbourne, uh, commitment uh, and indeed contracting in place uh, for Western Australia. And similarly, in Brisbane, we're building a facility that is actually proximate to the airport, proximate to major hospitals, able to meet quarantine needs. If Queensland want to build Order. one that's a long way away from the international airport, that's their decision. I hope they're doing it for the right reasons, not political ones. Senator Watt, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. This week, Mr Morrison blamed Queenslanders for his own vaccine rollout failures and left Queensland to build and fund safe Order. quarantine without federal support. Why is Mr Morrison more interested in blaming Queenslanders than taking responsibility for keeping them safe from COVID-19? Order. Order. Senator Birmingham. Senator Watt. Mr President, I completely reject the premise of those questions. And the real question, of course, should be you know, why Order. does Senator Sorry, Watt Senator Birmingham, I'm, I'm going to ask you to cease and I'm going to let you start again because Senator Watt is interjecting so loudly I can't hear your answer. Well, maybe if you ask a question, you might want to listen to the answer yourself. Senator Birmingham to continue. Mr Senator President, as I was saying, I completely reject the premise of the questions from Senator Watt. Uh, and frankly, you know, the only question really is why does Senator Watt feel the need to misrepresent any statement and to continually play politics with these matters? We're proud as a government of the fact that Australians are turning out in record numbers to get vaccinated. We now have volumes coming Order. into the country of additional Senator vaccine Watt. in record numbers. We have nearly 9,000 distribution Senator points Watt. across the country. Uh, we've seen the 70 plus age group charge through more than 86% of them getting their first dose. Right across the whole population, more than 55% of 16 pluses have. We're soon to receive the Atagi advice in relation to 12 to 15 year olds, and we will be bringing them along with every other eligible Australian into this record-breaking vaccine rollout to get the job done, despite the negativity of the Labor Party. Senator McMahon. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator McKenzie. Can the Minister inform the Senate how the Liberal and Nationals government's record $110 billion — that's a lot of money — $110 billion infrastructure investment plan is helping to connect communities, to create jobs and support our economic recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. Minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Mr President, and thank you, Senator McMahon, for your question and your tireless efforts to represent the Territory here in this place. As you said, our government is investing more in infrastructure, a total of $110 billion more than any other government in our nation's history. Since 2013, we've committed over $50 billion in infrastructure to our regions, because we believe in the capacity of our regions and we believe in their capacity if you just add water. That is why uh, we've committed $1.6 billion to co-fund the construction of 30 water infrastructure projects which will actually provide water into the future, unlock the economic potential for new and expanded agriculture for regional Australians. We're driving investments in infrastructure that are enabling Northern Territory industries to grow and prosper, not just the croc industry, Senator McMahon. By doing so, we're charting a strong course to ensure the recovery of COVID-19. The Liberal and Nationals government has committed $3.2 billion to infrastructure projects in the Northern Territory since 2013, and in this budget, 
$323.9 million was committed to projects in the Territory that are expected to support more than 900 local jobs. We are upgrading vital road infrastructure with $150 million for phase two of the NT National Network highway upgrades and just over $173 million for the sixth corridor under the Roads of Strategic Importance initiative. This will support the development of the gas industry in the Beetaloo sub-basin, which I know you are incredibly passionate about. It will increase our gas supply, create more jobs and provide significant economic growth, not just for the NT but for the whole nation. Delivering improvements to roads used by rural communities within the Beetaloo, Beetaloo will benefit the residents, workers and visitors. It is clear from the investment that it is the Liberal National Governments that is committed to delivering the infrastructure our nation needs to economically Order. recover. Senator McMahon, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. <clears throat> that is indeed excellent news, Minister. Can you inform us uh, what infrastructure programs will improve safety and support growth and recovery in Northern Territory communities? Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm sure you'll be pleased to hear that the town of Catherine, the gateway to the region, has a strong tourism sector, schools and health facilities that will all benefit um, from the investments that we're making. And we haven't just stopped that where I uh, mentioned earlier. We've committed $139 million to upgrades to the Outback Way. We've got upgrades to roads that tourists use, uh, with one of the most spectacular parts of our beautiful nation, including the town of Alice. Together we have 26 projects under construction, and with, this is in addition to the 12 completed projects that we have committed to more than $395 million to. We have also committed more than $30 million to build the Tiger Brennan Drive and Berrima Road overpass to ensure a safer commute for the 20,000 motorists that use it. The project will see up to 155 jobs support at the peak of the works, and it will take nearly two years to complete. Senator McMahon, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. Great news for the Northern Territory. Uh, what investments is the government making in other critical projects, particularly in regional Australia, to uh, chart our way back from COVID-19? Senator McKenzie. Well, thank you, Senator McMahon. Since 2013, our government has committed more than $2.8 billion to support community infrastructure that promotes stable, secure and viable regional economies builds the, on the resilience of our communities as we recover from the pandemic. More than $247 million has been committed through the Regional Growth Fund for projects from construction of the Catherine Flood Mitigation and Headworks Project in the NT. For projects that help grow regional economies and provide sustainable employment, we have committed $206 million to the Regional Jobs and Investment Packages and $145 million to the Stronger Community Pro program, which has funded around 12,000 projects since 2015, because we believe in a recovery from COVID that will be led by regional Australia. Senator Pratt. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. A week ago, the Prime Minister promised to build a new quarantine facility at Jandicott Airport in Western Australia after the Department of Finance recommended uh, that site after a feasibility study. So why has Mr Morrison already broken that promise, announcing the quarantine station will now be moved to a new site near a contaminated RAAF base? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, if Senator Pratt bothered to look at any of the detail of what was said when the Jandicott site was announced as a preferred location uh, a little over a week ago, she would have, Mr. President, known that at the time I spoke very publicly about the fact that terms in relation to access to that site weren't settled, the contingency and backup plans looking at other sites were underway, Order. and that the government was reserving the right. Indeed, the memorandum Senator of understanding Watt. that we signed with the West Senator Australian Pratt. government, who are clearly far more mature on these issues than or the Anthony Albanese opposition, the West Australian government MOU that we signed actually acknowledged the fact uh, that there were contingency sites underway. The WA government has been engaged, involved and aware of that. Now, what we've done is uh, move to the Bullsbrook site, the Defence Training Centre there, on the basis of it being the site that will enable us to most efficiently in terms of time and money, get the project built and delivered. 
That's why we're going there. It's that simple. Senator Pratt, a supplementary question. The proposed quarantine facility, which still has no budget, no contractor, no timeline, and will not take quarantine out of Perth CBD hotels, and it won't even uh, uh, open until two years after the start of this pandemic. Why is Mr Morrison so slow to act in keeping Western Australians safe? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, I, I note Senator Pratt there claiming that there's no contractor. If she bothered to read her hometown newspaper, The Western Australian today, she would actually see that we announced the contractor for construction on the Bullsbrook site yesterday. I thank Multiplex for the work they're doing on that site, as they are elsewhere around the country. They're in a position where they're going and to get the designs finalised, the approvals finalised, and construction underway the month after next. Senator Pratt, final supplementary question. Mr Morrison has called Western Australians cave dwellers and has now delayed construction of a new quarantine facility, all after siding with Clive Palmer against Western Australia's border restrictions. Why does Mr Morrison continually Order. show such contempt for Western Australia? Order. Order. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, that's strike three from Senator Pratt. Three questions, three failures, and three statements that are completely Senator false, Watt. incorrect, or failing facts. Uh, Mr Senator President, Watt. as I made clear yesterday when Senator Pratt tried this on, the Prime Minister said no such thing. We're grateful for the fact that West Australians, like all Australians, are turning out in record numbers to get vaccinated. We're confident that West Australians Order. want us to stick to a plan that gives them back the opportunity to engage with the rest of Australia, that gives them back the opportunity to engage with the rest of the world. That's what our national plan is all about, driving the vaccination numbers for Australians to points where we can all get back those freedoms and liberties. Whether you live in Western Australia or Queensland, New South Wales or South Australia, Victoria or Tasmania, all the territories, we want every single Australian to have the chance to get back those freedoms. Listening to those opposite, despite they say they back the plan, it's clear they speak with Order. forked tongue. Senator Birmingham. It's perfectly clear the time they the don't has expired. and expired. Senator Van. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Minister, with the Tokyo Paralympics underway, can you outline how the Paralympics and our Australian para-athletes are inspiring people with disability to follow their dreams and to pursue new opportunities particularly in the face of the challenges presented by COVID-19. The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and thanks Senator Van for his question. Well, a few weeks ago, I think Australia felt the Olympic spirit as we watched the Olympic Games. And once again this week, we feel the Olympic spirit as we watch our Paralympians compete in the Paralympic Games. And it's another opportunity for us all to celebrate and unite around our incredible sporting achievements. So good to see the Australian team leading the medal tally already after an amazing 10 medals yesterday. Resilience, determination and strength underpins our Olympic team. Uh, and we have to understand that so many of our athletes have undertaken and overcome extraordinary adversity to be in Tokyo. And it's important that this importantly reminds us that when we focus on what people's ability is instead of focusing on their disability, how much more can be achieved. This year, our team in Tokyo is the largest ever team that we've sent overseas, second only to the Sydney 2000 team, with 178 uh, athletes performing across 18 sports. Uh, the Aussies have always finished in the top five, and I can see no reason why that won't happen again this time. To the whole team, we are watching you, we are cheering you on. You are an inspiration to us all, but you are an especial inspiration to Australians who live with disability. So a big congratulations to Paige Greco and Emily Petricola for winning gold on the cycling tack track. Yeah. To Rowan Crothers, to Ben Popham, to William Martin, to Lakeisha Patterson for winning gold in the pool. Just getting to the Olympic Games has been an extraordinary challenge given the circumstances we find ourselves in and the challenges of COVID to compete on the world stage. 
I hope everybody in Tokyo reaches whatever goal they sought to go there for, whether it's a personal best, winning a gold, or in the case of my mate Dylan Alcott, hopefully achieving that extremely difficult golden grand slam. Yeah. To our Paralympics, good luck. Australia's proudly watching you compete in our green and gold. Senator Van, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, as we work to deliver the national plan agreed by National Cabinet, how is the Liberal and Nationals government ensuring that people with disability can fully participate in the workforce and take part in our economic recovery from COVID-19? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, we know that a lack of information and support can be an extraordinary barrier to participation and independence. And throughout this pandemic, especially uh, as we move through the national plan, we want to make sure that we support people to get the access to the supports that they need to look after themselves during the lockdown, but to know what's on the other side. And that's why we've invested in the National Disability Gateway to assist with people with disability, their families and their carers, to access the information and a range of supports in a range of different areas, from health and, to, and uh, employment services, uh, and supporting to keep them connected to their communities during this really yeah. difficult time. In particular, uh, the leisure function on the Disability Gateway website can connect budding athletes with sporting centres near them and so that they can hopefully find a sporting club that suits their and, and, and is right for them. And that's why we've partnered with Get Skilled Access to develop an online platform so they can do exactly that. Order. Senator Van, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Minister, how is the government also supporting people with a disability in other endeavours, including to take up sport in their local community? Senator Rustin. Well, thank you very much. Well, we know how sport can be a powerful tool in breaking down barriers and eliminating stigmas, but unfortunately it's something that not everyone is able to do right now given the current COVID restrictions. But we know that sport can play an incredibly important role in helping people feel both included and to feel valued. So the Sport for All program is designed to help and work through 500 schools and local clubs uh, to provide accessibility for sport for people with disability in remote communities and also our culturally and linguistically diverse people. So it might be passing a basketball or having a rally at tennis. It's all about providing every Australian with the opportunity to participate in sport. And this program is being developed by our uh, world-class Olympian Dylan Orcott through his organisation Get Skilled Access, which has got years of experience. But most particularly, these are programs that are designed by people for people with disability. And Order, the... Senator Rustin. <laughs> Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President. And I ask that further questions be now placed on notice. Are there any motions to take note of answers, Senator Watt? There are, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senators Colbeck, Reynolds and Birmingham to the questions asked by Senator Mc Senators McAllister, O'Neill, Pratt and myself. Today we saw a very important announcement by the Queensland Government, and that is that they will go it alone on the building and funding of a new purpose-built quarantine station in Queensland. There can be no doubt whatsoever that quarantine is a federal responsibility. It is crystal clear in the Australian Constitution. But, but throughout this pandemic, we have seen this Prime Minister and this government shirk their constitutional responsibility to build quarantine facilities to keep Australians safe from COVID-19. In the 18 months since this pandemic began, we have seen not one quarantine facility built by this Prime Minister, despite it being his constitutional responsibility to do so. Yet again, we have seen the Prime Minister, who is slow to act and who fails to take responsibility even when something is set out in the Constitution for all to read. Now, the result of this government's and this Prime Minister's failure to act is that we have now seen 27 leaks of COVID-19 from hotel quarantine, uh, which have caused all sorts of outbreaks across the country, including the most recent disastrous outbreak in Sydney that is now recording national record COVID infection numbers. 
It is that failure from this government to act and build quarantine facilities, along with its failure to deliver the vaccine rollout, that is causing the lockdowns across the country that are causing so much misery uh, and that is putting the remainder at the country of risk. So I congratulate the Queensland Government on its announcement today that it will go it alone and build this quarantine station uh, near Toowoomba in Queensland. We cannot wait any longer for a federal government that refuses to take responsibility to do its job and that is completely slow to act to protect Australians. This proposal is something that was raised uh, first by the Queensland Government in January this year. Uh, they have had a proposed site since that time and a willing owner, but throughout the process, the Prime Minister, rather than taking responsibility, has just made excuse after excuse for why he won't support this quarantine station. First of all, he said that it doesn't have a suitable hospital, but we established at Senate Estimates that the Federal Department of Health has never even assessed Toowoomba Base Hospital to, to establish whether it is suitable to support a quarantine facility. And his other excuse, of course, is that it doesn't have an international airport. That's despite the fact that Wellcamp Airport currently receives international freight flights on many, many occasions, shipping fruit, vegetables and other products in and out of this country. So it does have an international airport. It does have a hospital. What it doesn't have is a Prime Minister who is actually prepared to take responsibility and build the quarantine station that Queenslanders need. In fact, the, the Prime Minister's ignorance of Queensland is so great that he also said uh, that one of the reasons he opposed building a quarantine station near Toowoomba is that we shouldn't have quarantine stations near the desert. How ignorant do you have to be of Queensland's geography to, us to be claiming that Toowoomba is near the desert? I invite the Prime Minister to get in a car and see how many hours it takes him to get from Toowoomba to the desert so that he actually has some understanding of the state of Queensland. Now, the Prime Minister has had an absolute shocker of a week bagging Queensland. First of all, he called us cave dwellers. Uh, despite the fact that we have actually managed COVID-19 better than almost any state around Australia, and certainly better than his preferred state, preferred Liberal state of New South Wales, who he described as being the gold standard and who he praised for their late lockdown. But it's us in Queensland who are the cave dwellers, according to the Prime Minister. Then he went on to blame Queenslanders for our vaccination rates, despite the fact that the vaccine rollout is his job. What is it with this bloke? Every time he's got a job, he can't do it, and then he blames someone else for it. So apparently it's Queenslanders' fault for not having enough vaccine, vaccines put in their arms, even though it's his job, the Prime Minister's job, to get those vaccinations happening. And of course now we see that he's leaving it to Queensland to go it alone in building the quarantine stations that are his job, that are his responsibility under the Australian Constitution. And in fact, he's even had one of his own senators, Senator Canavan, go public today saying that in response to the Queensland Government's announcement, the federal government should pull Defence Force troops off the Queensland borders. That's the kind of support that, this, that Queensland is getting from this government. They've got a Prime Minister who just wants to bag us continually and leave us to ourselves, and they've even got senators from Queensland who want to rip Defence Force troops off our borders. This government has a problem with Queensland, and it's about time they started delivering. Thank you, Senator Watts. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Well, that was a very sad contribution. Senator Watt, a sad contribution from a sad opposition. We had a moment of hope last year. We had a moment of hope 18 months ago that those opposite would actually take their responsibilities as an alternative government seriously and actually work together with the government, and we are the government, the Australian people elected us, to get through a global pandemic, a global pandemic the like of which the world has not seen for a hundred years. And instead, that moment of that moment of hope, that moment of light from the opposition, for, that the opposition would actually take this seriously and not delve into the politics of it, lasted such a brief period of time. Luckily, luckily, we still have the national cabinet, where cabinet, where states and territories are still working together to find a path out of this pandemic, and that path has been mapped by the national cabinet, led by the Morrison government, and that path is clear to people, and that path is based on an accelerating vaccine rollout. And guess what, Senator Watt? Guess what, those opposite? The vaccine rollout is accelerating. 
Did it have some issues? It absolutely did. It absolutely had some issues, Senator Polly, and we admitted those issues and confronted those issues. The medical advice on the AstraZeneca, the, the age recommendation on AstraZeneca changed, and that did cause a lot of hesitancy regards AstraZeneca. However, that has largely flowed through now, and we see that people are embracing AstraZeneca as a very good, a very effective vaccine against this pandemic, along with Pfizer, soon along with the Moderna vaccine. And we've seen it. We see it every, we see it every day. Do those opposite actually look at the numbers that are coming out every day? 335,000 335, vaccines administered yesterday. The day before, 307,000. 307,000 accelerating every day. In the last 28 days, and I'm sure Senator O'Sullivan knows the answer to this, and I'm sure Senator Askey knows the answer, how many vaccines have we seen uh, administered in the last 28 days? 6.16 million. Six million plus vaccinations administered in the last 28 days. And now, now, under medical advice, we're starting to talk about younger Australians. The medical advice on 12 to 15-year-olds is starting to come through from ATAGI. We've had preliminary advice so far. It's going to be considered by the National Security Committee of Cabinet, and the final advice hopefully will be available very, very soon. And do we know how many people are in that category in Australia, in that 12 to 15-year age group? I suspect those on this side do. Those on that side, I bet they wouldn't have a clue. 1.2 million. 1.2 million. So Senator O'Sullivan, Senator Askew, they could do the numbers easily. If you're doing six million doses approximately every 30 days, 1.2 million. Obviously, you've got to wait the time period between administering the two doses. But this will be incorporated into what is now an accelerating and very successful vaccine rollout. And I remind those listening to this today just how quick that acceleration has been. Uh, in March, 770,000 vaccines administered. By June, that's risen to 3.5 million. July, 4.5 million. Last 28 days, 6.16 million doses. And those opposite, they want to carp, they want to criticise, they want to cast a political lens on this as we do head towards an election. And that is just very sad. And I think the Australian people will cast their judgment on the Labor Party's response to this pandemic very harshly indeed. I think the Australian people will judge your response to this pandemic very harshly indeed because this was an opportunity for Australians to pull together. Australians want a, a pathway out of this. Australians are embracing a pathway out of this. We only need to look at these vaccination rates to know that Australians have embraced the Morrison government's pathway out of this Order. pandemic. They Order. want the freedoms. They want Senator the liberties Polly. that will come with a successful vaccine program, and that is what the Morrison government is delivering. Thank you, Senator Brockman. Senator Pratt. This government takes West Australians for mugs. That's the approach this government has taken when it comes to negotiating with the state government about quarantine facilities. We have been promised a new quarantine facility at Jandicott Airport a week ago. That's what the Prime Minister promised. And yet, less than a week, about a week later, that site now moves to the, uh, near the RAF airbase. Now, what Minister Birmingham said in his response today, he tried to imply that the state government had some, somehow insisted about the announcement. Well, I can assure you and I can assume that, of course, Premier Mark McGowan is going to go, if you want Western Australia to sign up to some kind of pathway out of our lockdowns, then this Commonwealth government has to put take responsibility for quarantine and it has to make public that responsibility. I'm damn sure that that's about what happened, that Mark McGowan said, yes, you've got to get out and announce this, otherwise there's no way that we're going to sign up to your um, pathway out of lockdowns. 
So what happens here is, of course, the government has to rush out and announce this because it hasn't yet done a proper assessment. It hasn't yet actually done the work. All this demonstrates it is that this government is extremely late to the party when it comes to taking responsibility for quarantine. For quarantine, and these facilities are not even going to be finished until March last year, next year. And when you look at these uh, announcements, it says, "Oh, well, we're still designing them. We're still looking at how they're going to be laid out. What's going to happen?" All of that demonstrates is that this government has done two fifths of whatever to get this underway before, the, before Mark McGowan said, come on, I've been asking you about this for months and months. Last April, Mark McGowan asked about when are you going to take your quarantine facilities responsibility seriously. Last year, Mark McGowan was asking, why isn't the Commonwealth taking responsibility for quarantine? Only now, only now, when uh, the Prime Minister wants to be uh, the champion of freedom and cover up for his mistakes in New South Wales. Of course, all West Australians, all Australians want to be free. They want to be out uh, from under lockdowns. But we have had a sure and true path to freedom in Western Australia, which has been to act quickly, to act quickly when we've needed to with short, sharp lockdowns, the kinds of lockdowns that were New South Wales required and didn't deliver on, didn't deliver at all in terms of a pathway out of uh, COVID. So here we are, here we are at this point in the pandemic, 18 months after it starts, and only now does the Commonwealth government come out and say, oh yeah, we will build some quarantine facilities for you in Western Australia. Doesn't seem like the government wants to build any for Queensland. This is all about the negotiations that have happened in uh, National Cabinet, I'm quite sure, all about where Mark McGowan said, come on, you've got to live up to your quarantine responsibilities and we're not going to sign up until you, until you, until you make good on taking up your responsibilities. It's not because this government took proactive responsibility. It's not because, yes, this government said, we really understand that for Australia to open up, for Australia to open up, as the Prime Minister has said he wants it to, we have to have purpose-built quarantine facilities. We absolutely have to. And yet, it appears, we're not going to get them until March next year. Now, these are not complicated facilities. They're not all that difficult to build. The difficulty comes in in staffing them and running them and doing all of that properly. These are not all that difficult to build. And this government has barely, it has finally said, yes, we'll build quarantine facilities, but they're not even going to be ready until uh, March next year, because they're still being planned, they're still being designed, and it's very, very clear that this government has done nothing Thank you, until Senator this Pratt, point in time. time. Has expired, and I just remind you to refer to the Premier by his correct title, uh, Senator Askew. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Well, where do these questions come from? <laughs> The opposition are repeatedly coming in here to try and twist commentary made elsewhere to suit their political agenda or, as we've seen today, raise anxiety in parents about their children if they contract COVID-19. Taking comments out of context is misleading and raising concerns by spreading fear throughout the community is not worthy of those opposite. Madam Deputy President, it's been a very difficult week in this place. With minimal numbers in the building and here in the chamber, we've managed to ensure that the parliament of our great nation continues to function. Yet once again, those opposite choose to come in here and rehash the same questions, the same themes, attacking the vaccine rollout and trying to belittle the Prime Minister for standing up for and committing to a policy that has been agreed to by National Cabinet. The National Cabinet is not just a federal coalition policy. 
It's been agreed by every state and territory leader across the country. Mark McGowan in Western Australia, Stephen Marshall in South Australia, Gladys Berejiklian in New South Wales, Anastella pa Anastasia Palaszczuk in Queensland, Peter Gutwin in my home state of Tasmania, Daniel Andrews in Victoria, Michael Gunner in the Northern Territory and Andrew Barr here in the ACT. They have all committed to this plan, not just once but regularly over recent weeks during their national cabinet meetings. The Australian people want their politicians to be held to account and deliver the relaxed restrictions and greater freedoms they have been promised when vaccination rates reach the agreed levels of 70 and 80 per cent. That's why so many Australians are doing the right thing and turning out in record numbers to be vaccinated. While those opposite continue to spread lies and mistruths, our government is focused on getting on with the job and keeping Australians safe. In relation to the vaccine rollout, it's exciting to see the more reluctant premiers finally engaged in the conversation, encouraging all Australians to be vaccinated. Just a few hours ago, I heard Premier Andrews urging all Victorians to go out and get vaccinated so that their latest lockdown can end, highlighting the hundreds of thousands of appointments available across Victoria. And it's good to see that their numbers are increasing, with over 52 per cent of eligible residents in Victoria having received their first dose. Similarly, in New South Wales, where their rollout continues to gain speed with record vaccinations rec being recorded daily, they now have over 61 per cent with their first dose and 33 per cent having had both doses. A massive improvement and great to see New South Wales residents coming forward to be vaccinated in their droves. Well done and thank you to each and every one who has come forward. While the opposition continues to undermine this national rollout, our government continues to deliver record numbers of vaccination daily, over 307,000 recorded in the last 24 hours. In the course of the last seven days, over 1.8 million doses have been delivered and 17.7 .7 million doses have been delivered to date. In my home state of Tasmania, nearly 40, 420,000 doses have been administered so far with just under 57 per cent having had one dose and over 38 per cent fully vaccinated with their second dose. It's disappointing to note, however, that there are still two states where less than 50 per cent of their population aged over 16 have had, un, have had their first dose. Perhaps not surprisingly, they are Queensland, as highlighted by Senator Watt in his question to Senator Birmingham today, and Western Australia. At a federal level, we are getting on with the job. The Australian government has secured more than 280 million COVID-19 vaccines, including 125 million Pfizer BioNTech vaccines. It's time those states that are being left behind also get on with the job of delivering the vaccinations that are available to them. Furthermore, Madam Deputy President, the ramped up rollout roll is just the start. Not only will the vaccination of Australians help save lives, it will also help us to relax restrictions as we progress through the four stages of the national plan. Our government is taking a balanced approach to this plan, listening to the scientific and medical evidence and taking into consideration the economic advice and impact to set out a clear plan that will return Australia to some semblance of a normal lifestyle. By sticking to this plan, we will give hope and confidence to all Australians, give businesses the confidence to turn the lights back on and reopen, perhaps borrow from their banks to do so and employ more Australians. It also gives Australians confidence in relation to their health, that the hospitals will be able to cope and doctors will be available to assist them should they contract, contract COVID-19, even if vaccinated. In relation to the plan, and as you're aware... Thank you, well, Senator Askew. Your time has expired, and I remind you to, to refer to state premiers by their correct title. Senator Polly. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. Well, first, just to clarify, the accusations by the government senators in this debate today that it's ours on this side are out campaigning against the rollout of vaccines. There couldn't be anything further from the truth. You sit with your colleague from the back bench here in this chamber who has gone out and campaigned against the vaccine. Your own back bench in the other house have been out campaigning against the vaccine. So don't come into this chamber lecturing us 
we have been out promoting very strongly the rollout of vaccines. And in fact, it's your own Liberal uh, State Minister in Tasmania, the Minister for Health, Jeremy Rockcliffe, who has said today that the Tasmanian borders will not open until there is full vaccination. That's what he said, including children. And yet, what have we seen? What have we seen and heard in this chamber today, particularly for First Nations children in Western New South Wales? 40 per cent of those children of our First Nations have not been vaccinated. We know they're the highest cohort of young people in this country that is contracting COVID-19 and Delta. Uh, variant of that. But have we had a, any minister who could actually give us any figures when we asked today? No, we haven't. Three strikes in softball and you're out. Three strikes uh, of breaking the law in some states in the US, you go to jail. But we have a minister here responsible for youth and she failed on three occasions. Strike three. She should be out. Not only should she be out of the front bench or off the front bench, but so sh too should Senator Colbeck. The Minister for Health, in any other time, the Prime Minister of the day would have sacked the Minister for Health for such a failing to be able to roll out a vaccine in a timely manner. Now, it really gets on my goat when I listen to those people on that side of the chamber. They're, they're almost bragging about the amount of vaccines that have been rolling out now. Well, I'm sorry to actually allude to this, but the fact is you're way behind the times. Then we have the Minister for Aged Care coming in here representing the Minister for Health and saying we're still learning about what the vaccine's going to do to young people. Well, I have no confidence whatsoever in that minister or in Scott Morrison because we know that internationally COVID-19 hit uh, America, the United States and Europe before it came here. Did we learn anything from that? No, we didn't. This Prime Minister was so cocky that he didn't even go out and do his first job of attack and that was to secure enough vaccine to keep safe every Australian in this country. And now they're telling us we're still waiting to learn. You need to have a plan because Australian families, I have children, I have grandchildren, and so does almost everyone else in this chamber. And I truly believe that everyone in this chamber cares about rolling out this vaccine in a timely way. But we've had a crisis that the Prime Minister has been a not able to address. He's had a job to ensure the health of all Australians. And here we are today with not one minister in this chamber can reassure us and the Australian people that they have a plan to address the crisis that is hitting young people in this country. The Delta variant is targeting our young people. And we've got a Prime Minister who is not addressing that most recent crisis. He's failed to protect the health of all Australians. He's failed to build the appropriate uh, quarantine facilities that we need in this country. And we have government senators coming in here with, a, I'd have to say, quite a lacklustre performance of trying to defend their government for the failings that they have had. Now, every death that has occurred in this country under the Prime Minister's watch, I know from what calls I'm getting and emails I'm getting into my office, as my colleagues do, is this government will be judged and they will be judged very harshly Thank along you, with Senator the Prime Polly, Minister the of the day. Expired. So the question is that the motion is put by Senator Watt to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. You've just got a couple of minutes, um, Senator Hanson-Young. Thank you. Well, um, I just rise to take note of uh, the answers given to me from S Senator Zizelja. Well, clearly, Senator Zizelja was not across his brief today. I asked a question about his government's energy policy. He couldn't answer it. And instead of 
trying his best, he turns around and decides to accuse me of being angry. Now, this sums up this government and the Morrison men in this government. Sexist, patronising and not across their brief. Look, mate, it's not my fault if you don't have the answers to the questions you're being asked. It's question time. Come here briefed. Be prepared to answer. You know, we're all sick and tired, women in this country, of the sexist, patronising dismissal of men like you in suits. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Hanson Young. So the question is: The motion is moved by Senator Hanson Young be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. Government business order of the day.